to walk with God. He understood what it was to have God in his life. But one thing I find very, very interesting is that when you look at David's life, and really to understand the Psalms that David wrote, you need to understand his life. You need to be able to look at First and Second Samuel and see his life and how it, how it uh, developed and the favor of God that was on his life. But isn't it interesting that when you look at David's life, and it explicitly, Scripture makes it very clear that God was with him, that he was an anointed man, that God had enabled him and empowered him to walk with, with him and gave him place, gave him position, gave him power, gave him purpose, gave him passion. And yet, when you look at David's life, it wasn't what you would call all roses. True? It wasn't exactly what you'd call a rosy life. If you look and see all the things that happened to him, it would be very easy to come to the conclusion that, you know, I really don't want that kind of presence in my life. That I don't want that kind of circumstances, those kind of relationships, those kind of difficulties, those kind of adversities that come in my life. You look at it, you realize that here's a man who, as a, as a young man, first of all, is all his brothers are... Are in, the, uh, are in the house and basically around the dad and he's the one who's watching over the sheep dealing with the lions and the bears by himself. When you look and realize that he's the one who's just been anointed that's going to be king, he's going to be the one that's going to be raised up as God said, I'll raise up a man after my own heart. This is the man. He's anointed to be king and yet he's the one who's going to be chased. He's the one that's going to have spears thrown at him. He's the one that's going to be mocked, scourged. He's the one that's going to be talked about, gossiped about. He's the one that will be plotted against. When you look at all of the things that are taking place in his life, and you realize here's a man who supposedly is going to just walk with, with absolute, uh, 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 absolute uh, presence of God and, the, and be able to have his position and his power and go to be king, and he's being chased to be killed. It doesn't exactly make a person an inspired person to say, yeah, that's what I want to happen to me. We have a tendency, and many things are being preached today, that are saying that if you have enough God, if you've been giving enough, you have enough faith, if you've been doing all the right things, that everything should be rosy, everything should be going well, everything should be nice in your life, all the relationships, no problems, and if something is not going right for you, then evidently you're not right with God. There is a teaching that makes that implication, that that kind of uh, makes that statement that everything should be going right in your life. If, if you're not getting enough, if you're your fault, it's because you're not giving enough. If you're having difficulty with sickness or relationships or circumstances, well, then maybe it's because your faith isn't strong enough. But yet you look at David's life and realize that the favor of God is definitely upon him. He's anointed to be king, and yet many difficulties are coming his way. Now, in Psalm 40, he captures pretty much his life. He captures things that are taking place, and he encourages one main aspect. I've broken it up into seven points. I figure we're at a half hour each point. <laughs> we should have a solid sermon. <laughs> but looking at Psalm, verse, uh, Psalm 40, verse 1 through 3, first of all, is the first section that we want to look at. Now, if you're taking notes, this is a great time to have an outline and then the best thing to do is to go back and look at those verses and look at those words and do it all in light of David's life. When you're looking at David's life and you're realizing what he's writing, it will minister to you, to your spirit man greatly to understand what it is that God wants in our lives. The first one, verses 1 through 3, says this, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. The first section, child, verse 1 through 3, is waiting upon the Lord. Waiting upon the Lord. This is the first aspect that is required of you and I when we start looking and listening for the movement of God in our lives. There are many times, many circumstances, many situations, many relationships that you and I are just going to be called to do one thing. Wait upon the Lord. Wait for the coming of His answer. 
even now as a saint of the living God, as a person who's been set apart by his favor, you and I are now waiting for the kingdom of God to dawn. Even though the kingdom of God has been placed within us, for Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, meaning the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, has set up his tabernacle, his presence is dwelling in your heart, your mind, your soul. He lives within, causing us to love God, to, to be empowered by his grace. In the midst of that, we're waiting for the kingdom of God. You look at the times and the troubles that are taking place in all the world, true? Look at the Mideast that has taken place and the boiling pot that has taken place over there. Just wicked people killing one another looking to damage, it doesn't matter whether children or home, it doesn't matter whether they're women, it doesn't matter, they're just destroying one another. When you look at the greed that is taking place in all of, all of capitalism, when you look at all of what's taking place with various gangs and, and various crime units, when you look at just what's taking place on the internet today, when you look at what's taking place with grandfathers and what they're doing with their own little granddaughters, you must have heard that news of what they're doing in order to try to raise a few bucks and have a little pleasure and put them on the internet. And the heart and the mind of man is messed up. It just goes to show that there's a wickedness that dwells in the heart of man and that there's a presence of the enemy that is seeking to devour the souls walking to and fro, seeking who he may devour, looking for a chink in the armor to destroy a person. When you look at this, and it says, first of all, waiting for the promise of God, waiting for the Lord. It's not looking and saying, when you look at these first three verses, he heard my cry. It doesn't say that he was, he, he was uh, enjoying our laughter. He heard my cry. Very personal. There are times in our lives where all we're going to do is cry. There's just a crying moment. Even the the Holy Spirit in the book of Romans. What does Paul say? That the Holy Spirit in us groans, moans, praying for us what we ourselves cannot utter. Groaning. There's a cry that we have. David understood this cry before the Lord. I've had times in my life. You probably had times in your life. Most likely you have, but all you could do is just kind of just let your spirit weep before the Lord. What happens sometimes is that people go into an emotional crying with mom, with dad, with best friend, with, with self-pity, but they don't go before the Lord and cry. He's the one who will incline his ear to hear. Scripture makes it clear. David made it clear that I waited patient for the, patiently for the Lord and the Lord inclined to me. He leans towards. When we have an inclination, an inclination means that we are leaning towards. We are drawing near to. David waited before the Lord patiently. Not one of the things that dwell in the flesh nature of man. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Patience is something that comes forth by the presence of God. Not something that we ourselves possess. If you're ever looking for patience to just come from the self-nature, you're going to wait a long time. The only way we usually ex exhibit patience is when we're expecting something that's worth our waiting. Patience is in the midst of adversity, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of not getting what we want right now. The Holy Spirit recognizes and the fruit of the Spirit comes forth knowing that He will hear your prayer. He will hear your cry. David suffered gossip, ridicule, scorn. He understood what it was to be in the miry clay. Verse 2, it says, He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, the mud where you can't move, stuck. Has anybody ever seen, has anybody ever experienced being stuck? You are just stuck. Now, sometimes I remember even my, uh, we had put a dug well into our house, and uh, uh, it was uh, really raining, it hadn't been quite settled, and it was really moist mud, and the grass hadn't set in, it was a brand new house, and everything hadn't quite settled around the well just yet. 
and my son, who was about four years old at the time, went running over to the well, and his feet went in about probably a foot, foot and a half. Now, on somebody who's about four feet tall, a foot and a half is a long way. And he was stuck. I went over to, to reach out over, over to pull him out, and he was, I mean, stuck. I had to dig the mud out, and when I finally was able to pull him out, his boots stayed there, and probably are still there. <laughs> Little red boots about this big. Stuck. Sometimes we get stuck in situations where there's, it's not anything of your own fault, nothing that you've done, maybe it is, but sometimes not. It's nothing, that, it's just something that's going on around your life, and you're, you don't know whether to go left, right, you don't know which way to go. You don't know what decision to make. You're just kind of stuck. David was in a horrible situation, stuck in the miry clay. But he says, but the Lord, he waited for the Lord patiently. The Lord inclined himself towards David. That's a humbling aspect in itself. God Almighty, creator of the universe, humbles himself to incline himself towards us. Yet man in his own stubbornness rarely will incline himself towards God. And yet the creator of the universe will incline himself towards the here man. Patiently he waited. Waiting patiently, and you can trust this, when you are waiting for the Lord, he will hear and he will help. This is something that needs to captivate your spirit and my spirit. When we wait patiently for the promise of God, when we wait patiently for his presence, when we cry before him, not calling everybody, not calling and looking for an ear to, to just unload everything that's going on. Sometimes that's needed, just a confession of the soul as to what's taking place. But I'm talking about when you have an honest to God crying spirit that you need to go before the Lord and just pour yourself out before Him. To not dress it up with some sort of religious fervor of just start speaking in the King James so that it makes you make sure they just, just speak honestly before the Lord. I remember a gentleman coming to me one time and says, I'm just mad at God. I'm just so mad. I said, well, did you tell him? He said, well, I can't tell him that. Oh, he... <laughs> well, you think you're going to surprise him? <laughs> did you tell him? Did you go before the Lord? Did you just maybe bow your knees before him and just say, I don't understand what's going on. I'm just so mad at what's taking place. And let him speak to you, to encourage, to uphold. If you do that, I can promise you this. He will hear you, and he will help you. He doesn't always take care of all the situations the way that you want them done around us. I can attest to that. I wish sometimes, you know, we, we would love to live maybe in a bewitched world. Just get things done. People love that sort of thing today. We just have to snap our fingers and wiggle our nose and get what we want. Didn't get breakfast on the commercial. Didn't get breakfast at 11, so you just move the clock back. Get what I want. <laughs> <laughs> but we are living in a world where impatience reigns, and we're called upon to wait patiently before the Lord. He will hear, and he will help. In verse 3, it says that he put a new song in David's mouth. See, the circumstances around us don't necessarily always change. He doesn't go and say, oh, okay, you're upset with this. All right, I'll take care of that. Oh, you want that person set? Okay, I'll take care of that. Oh, you mean business isn't going the way? All right, I'll take care of that. Instead, when we make our cry before the Lord, what does David say? He will put a new song in your heart. It starts out with a cry. It will end with joy. He puts a new voice in us, a new word, a newfound rejoicing, a newfound understanding, a newfound patience to be able to continue to rely on the Lord, which brings us to the second point. Verse 4 and 5, he goes into trusting in the Lord. First point, one through three, waiting upon the Lord. When you are waiting upon the Lord, it will lead to the second point. 
trusting in the Lord God. Verses 4 and 5 says this, Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust, and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works, which you have done, and your thoughts which are toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I could declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. When we're waiting upon the Lord, trusting in his word, it will lead us to trusting in the Lord. Now, not just trusting, but trusting in the Lord God. Trusting in his word, trusting that he will hear, trusting that he will help, I've had times in my life where I've gone to the Lord and said, are you hearing me? Do you, are you listening? Do you even know where I am? Now, those are all foolish questions because of course he does. But it's not, do you know? It's kind of like, would you make sure that I know? Would you give me that assurance in my heart that I know that you're hearing? I know that you are, but I need that internal presence confirming to my heart that you know where I am and what's going on. It's not that I don't trust that you know. I need to know that you know. More so than I ever did before. Trusting in the Lord is where this will go. Trust explicitly. It starts off with this great word, chapter uh, verse 4. Blessed. Blessed is the person who trusts in the Lord, who places their trust in the Lord. Well, when we place our trust in the Lord, what are we trusting in? You're trusting that he will hear you. You're trusting that he will help you. You're trusting that he will put a new song in your heart and in your mouth. You're trusting in that he will come for you. You're trusting that he will never forsake you. He will never leave you. You're trusting that he is preparing a place for you. You're trusting that when you go to the grave, that he will raise you up in the latter days. You're trusting that he's building a place for you in heaven. You're trusting that he will empower you to live a holy life. You're trusting that he will forgive you of your sins when you turn to him and confess your sins. You're trusting in his word. You're trusting in his promises. The scorners will come, do they not? The scorners will come. People will try to destroy the truth. There is an assault taking place today on truth. You and I need to understand what the truth is and replace our trust in the promises of God and say, no, I'm going to trust explicitly that he knows where I am. He knows my circumstances. And when I put my cry before him, he will incline his ear to me. He will hear and he will help. We serve a good God, and it says that, that I recount, oh, verse 5, many, O oh Lord, my God, are your wonderful works. Many are your thoughts, verse, verse 5, many are your thoughts which are toward us. I can't even recount them to you, Lord, in a systematic way. I can't even recount them in such a way that it even makes sense. Many are your works, and many are your thoughts towards us. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. I can't sit here and just number them one after another. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Now remember, this is David saying this. The one who was, who was anointed to be king who only wants to serve Saul and having spears thrown at him, having his own wife turned against him, having people out to kill him. He was the object of envy. And remember, as we've said, when there's envy present, strife will always follow. When you see strife, envy is there, someplace in someone's heart, stirring things. And here we find David, who was in the midst of all of this difficulty, writing and saying, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. One of the great difficulties taking place today in the church world, in the saints, is that they do not understand trusting in the Lord. They're trusting in maybe feeling good. They want everything to go well around us. We just want everything to be taken care of. We really do want the Lord to just, oh, uh, save that one, uh, take care of that. Uh, make sure this goes well. Give me that client. Need a few more dollars here. Oh, so if I just give more, you'll, I'll get more. And we just want to barter and barter, uh, barter with God all the time and bargain with him. When in actuality, the scripture makes it clear. Wait upon him patiently. Trust in the Lord. 
Blessed is the person who trusts in the Lord. Number three, verses six and eight. Verses six and eight is the key, is the key to this psalm. It says this, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. Verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Number three, obedience towards the Lord. Number one, waiting upon the Lord. Number two, trusting in the Lord. Number three, obedience towards the Lord. You and I are creatures of obedience. Or, when it comes to the things of God, creatures of disobedience. Because as the self-nature, flesh nature, the natural man of God cannot and will not obey the things of God. We obey the natural world. The natural man obeys the natural world. And the natural world is filled with death, filled with envy, filled with gossip, filled with anger, filled with all those things that you and I are trying to break free from. The new man in Christ, the new creation, the spirit man, is the one who wants to walk in the love, the joy, the peace, the patience of God. This spirit man wants God. That spirit man, that new thing in you, that holy thing in you, that's breaking forth as the body of Christ, the kingdom of God in us, wants to obey God and is, and is disobedient to the world. The old nature, the flesh nature that dwells within us as well, wants to and will always disobey God and be obedient to the things of the world. If there's a lie to be had in order to gain the advantage, the lie is coming. Not looking to be uh, 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 under anybody's authority, always looking to be in charge. David is writing and saying that, verse 6, sacrifice and offering God did not desire. See, David said, wait a minute now. It's not the lambs that you want. It's not the sacrifice that you're looking for. That's not what you're after. The offerings, that's not what you were after. The giving of the lambs and the goats and the bulls. And Wait a minute. That's not what you're after. That's not what your heart desires. And scripture makes that clear in other places. David comes to a newfound understanding. He understands the things of God. He says, that's not what you want. My ears you have opened. That word opened there means pierced, punctured, pierced. Whereas the word of God only goes so far in some people. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever seen a child, or perhaps you've seen this in people? Have you ever noticed when you don't want to hear something that you can just barely close your ears and just give a slight hum and you don't hear anything that's going on around you? person has their ear pierced to hear, punctured to hear. My ears you have opened. Anyone who can hear his voice today coming forth, your ears have been pierced, opened. You hear his voice. But the person who does not know God, you can speak to them, you can declare, you can testify, you can talk to, you can encourage, and it's not going to go any further. It just hits a barrier and goes no further. The Lord is the one who pierces that ear. He says, sacrifice an offering you didn't desire. My ears you've opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you didn't require. Wait a minute. You mean, I sin, so I have to bring the lamb, and I have to sacrifice the bull, and I have to pour out and sprinkle the blood. And Wait a minute. That's not, what, that's not all along what you were after. You were after something else. The heart of the person is what you're after. The heart of the person is what you're looking for. And then all of a sudden he says in verse 8, this is the key, this is the hinge of the whole, of the whole psalm. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is within my heart. Delighting in doing the will of God. Delighting 
in doing the will of God. Obedience towards the Lord is delighting to do the will of God. It's not a matter of I've just got to give more bulls and more goats and more blood and more this and more offerings. And no. It is having my ears pierced to hear the word of the Lord, having his law in my heart, and obediently following after God, delighting to do the will of God. Now David is saying all of this in the midst of many troubles going on around him. This is not in the midst of everything going well. This is in the midst of everything going bad. But he delights to do the will of God. Well, what must I do? Okay, well, well, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And we become doers when in actuality the law of God is calling for us to be patient and waiting for the Lord. To show love, goodness, joy, faithfulness, to have the fruit of the Spirit operating in our lives. In the midst of adversity, we're not looking to express wrath. In the midst of somebody doing us wrong, we're not looking to give back hate. In the midst of somebody offending us, we're not holding it and harboring it with bitterness. In the midst of somebody being stingy, we're not holding back, we're giving. In the midst of somebody not loving you, you're loving. In the midst of all the reasons of why not to have the joy, you have the joy. Saying, no, he knows where I am, he hears my voice. It's operating with the delight of doing the will of God. When you're being drawn away to do something that would give place for the flesh nature, instead a person says, no, I'm going to trust the Lord and follow after Him. Number four, verses 9 and 10. Testifying of the Lord God. Testifying of the Lord God. Verse 9 and 10 says, I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great congregation. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. O Lord, you yourself know I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. What does that say? I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. Remember what Jesus said? Who sets a light? Who puts a light on and then and then covers it. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. Verse 9 and 10, testifying of the Lord God. Not concealing his righteousness, not concealing his truth. You know, it's easy to be a Christian in the four walls of the church. It's easy to be a person of truth when there's no lies tempting you. It's easy to be a person of loving kindness when everybody's loving you. It's easy to be a person of grace when everybody's being nice. It's easy to be a person of righteousness when we're not being challenged in any way, not confronted in any way. It's easy to be a person of God when everything around us is going godly. When the nation was known, when America, the nation, was known basically as a true Christian nation, and, and wholesomeness and purity kind of dominated, even though you had the subculture and everybody maybe in their darkened closets operated their sins, nevertheless, as a whole, as a nation, we were known basically as a wholesome nation, a pure nation. It was easier to be so-called Christian, to be godly. But the more we see the rise of, of immora immorality, the more that we see the rise of deception and crime, the harder it is to be a person of truth, the harder it is to be a person of righteousness, the harder it is to be a person of loving kindness, and you can't do it in your own power. I can't do it in my own power. That's where the loving kindness of the Lord, the truthfulness of God, the Christ Almighty, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the truth, Christ Almighty, the Spirit of Christ in us, causes us to live and testify of the goodness of the Lord. I delight to do your will. What is your will? Be a person of truth. I delight to do your will, verse 8 says. What is your will? To be a person of righteousness. Psalm 4 says, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Doing the right thing. What's the right thing? Well, whatever Auntie May says. No, it's whatever Bible says. Well, whatever Uncle George says. Whatever he says, I do. No, it's what the Bible says. What Christ did. 
It's, well, whatever the church, you know, as long as people in the church accept what I'm doing, it must be all right. No, it's what the Bible says. Hallelujah. What the Bible says is what we do. Our faith and practice is built upon what the Word of God says, not upon what the commands of man say. And so therefore we look and see God is saying, I have not hidden righteousness in my heart. Rather, I have expressed it. I exhibit it. Remember what James says? Don't be just a sayer, but be a doer of the Word of God. In this, I have declared your faithfulness, and I have declared your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness. Loving kindness is not just saying, I love you. You know how many love yous are going around the world today? Love you. Love you. Love you. When in actuality, expressing loving kindness in the midst of things not going well. Showing the kindness and the love of God when you're not being loved now, that's loving kindness. Hallelujah. But when we're all being loved, if you all love me, it's easy for me to love you. But you put a couple of sticklers in here. It can get a little, more, a little bit more difficult. The love of God, the love of God, the loving kindness is not to be concealed. The salvation of the Lord is not to be hidden. The testimony of what God has done and is doing in your life is not to be hidden. What is God doing in your life is not to be hidden. We are to declare it from the rooftops, God has been good to me. God is coming back to me. God saved me and pulled me out of the miry clay and he set us on solid ground, once on sinking sand, now on the solid rock on which I stand. This is what has taken place. This is what is taking place. This is what he's going to do in my life. I can see it happening and you start expressing and living the word of God out in your life. I've not concealed it. I've not hidden it. I have instead expressed it to the great congregation. Next, we find in verse 11 and 12, number five, upheld by the Lord God. We have waited upon the Lord. David has trusted in the Lord God. He's been obedient towards the Lord. He's testified in righteousness and in declaration. And now he says, being upheld by the Lord God. Verse 11 and 12 says, Do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually do what? Preserve me. Preserve me. Uphold me. Strengthen me. For innumerable evils have surrounded me. My own iniquities have overtaken me, so that I am not able even to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. David understood what it was to fail the Lord. David understood what it was to fall short. I've come across people in church circles. I've come across people in outside the church world that walk in a sort of self-righteousness that it seems that they never fall short. You know, they're always like the best. They're always up there. They're, they're just walking with the, with the total self-reliance and the self-assurance and the self-righteousness that they do no wrong. It's always everybody else's fault. They're right with God. I remember in being in a service one time, God was moving powerfully and the preacher that I, I was in the pew and the preacher said, you know, that, that being right with God, are you right with God today? And that is everything, you need to make something right. And this lady just came right up after service and says, I know that I'm perfectly right with God and there's nothing he wants me to change in my life. Really? There's nothing in your life that God wants to change. I mean, you're, you're all set. Then why hasn't he taken you already? If you're all so prepared, I can assure you of this, I've served the Lord, I love the Lord, and I have things that need to be worked on. And the Bible has made clear in Galatians 5 that as long as I'm walking in this flesh, there will be things for me to work on. A battle is taking place. And we need to overcome. He says that he will uphold you. David just said, I've not hidden your truth. David has just said, I've not concealed your salvation. I've made it known to the great congregation, and he immediately follows with it, but please preserve me. Give me your loving kindness. See, David knew it wasn't in himself. Give me your truth. Give me loving kindness. You're the one who needs to preserve me. My own iniquities are overtaken me like the hairs of my head. Some people are making that job easier than others. <laughs> but our own iniquities, 
understanding our own sinfulness, coming to grips with the knowledge of our own iniquity, our own shortcomings, understanding where you and I fall short, and yet not living in that kick the can woe mentality of, I'll never measure up, I'll never be what God wants me to be, I'm a nobody, I'm a nothing. Instead it turns to placing your cry before the Lord and saying, I need your loving kindness. I need to be preserved by you. I need to be upheld by you. I need your strength. I need to know I'm right with you. I need to be able to have your power to, to, to declare the goodness and greatness of God. That's what I need. And he says, the innumerable evils have surrounded me, numberless, all around me, gossip and envy, all around me, deceit and lies, all around me, people trying to do me. And David was always being plotted against to be killed, and eventually even by his own family. David understood what it was to have innumerable evils around him being plotted against him. And if you are a person of the Lord, then there is a plot to devour your soul. Yes, there is a plot to devour your soul. Be on guard, ladies and gentlemen. Be on guard and beware, saints of God. There is a plot to draw you away from the truthfulness of God. In this, you can be upheld by his tender mercies. You can be upheld by his loving kindness. And you can be upheld by his truth. Remember, God is love. Verse 13 and 15, continuing on with number six. Deliverance from the Lord. Deliverance comes from the Lord. He delivers. Verse 13 and 15 says this. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who seek to destroy my life. Let them be driven backward and brought to dishonor who wish me evil. Let them be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha! Aha! We're talking about the scorners. Those who look upon David's life, who look upon God working in his life, and says, Deliverance is not going to come by me drawing my sword. Deliverance is not going to come by me taking a self-assertive stance and holding my ground. Deliverance will come by operating in the truth, the loving kindness and tender mercies of the Lord. He's the one who delivers us. I've been in situations, I would trust that you've been in situations, that only the Lord God will deliver you. Does that mean that you wait in such a way that, well, well, when he takes care of it, he takes care of it, comes here, comes off? No. You and I wait upon the Lord, meaning that we are working while we're waiting. We are looking for His coming. We're not walking in some sort of fatalism like, well, whenever He shows up, He shows up. We're not waiting like we're waiting for like uh, Uncle George. Just go, whenever He gets here, He gets here. He's always late anyway. No, we're looking for and waiting for and working towards the coming of the Lord. We know that He hears us. We know that He will help us. And we live our lives in light of that He's already heard it and He's already done it, and He's already helped us. And we trust in that, knowing that His word is true. And David says He will deliver. There are scorners out there. There are people who are looking to do evil. Just watch the news. Just watch what's taking place in the various doctrinal stages today. Even some, some various Christian sermons that are coming forth will, will have a little hint of, of things that aren't quite right with the things of God. And, and you've got to know the truth. They'll draw you away from understanding the truthfulness of God. We must we need to understand. Let them be driven back to dishonor. But Lord, I know you will bring me to a place of honor. He will do that. Trust in the Lord. He's the one who will deliver you. Lastly, number seven, rejoicing because of the Lord God. Rejoicing. Verses 16 and 17 says this. Let all those who seek you Rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. When we look at these scriptures, we realize that it begins with this last statement. We started off waiting for the Lord. Trusting in the Lord. Obeying the Lord testifying of the Lord, being upheld by the Lord, delivered by the Lord. And lastly, let us rejoice 
in the Lord. But notice, in that same section of Scripture, he says, do not delay, Lord. Do not delay. God's always on time. God's speed. But he understands, David understands, do not delay means that there's still a waiting process involved. But in the waiting process, it is a time of rejoicing, knowing that he hears you, knowing that he will help you. Your own church environment here, you're looking upon the Lord. You're waiting for the Lord. Boy, I just wish we could have it this way, this way, this way, and this way right now. Is that not so? We, we have situations maybe in business, or we have situations in our families, our neighborhoods. I'd like it done this way, this way, this way, and this way, like right now. I wish we could just straighten this out and have that done. But it doesn't. In the midst of their waiting for the Lord, the Lord will be doing a work in your life, and in my life, and in our life. In this, we walk with a rejoicing spirit. We are looking for His coming, not just for the dawning of the end of the age, but we're looking for His coming in our own heart. We're not looking for the coming of the Lord just at the end of the age. We're looking for the coming of the Lord in our own hearts. Hallelujah. Stir my heart, Lord, to have more love for you, more tender mercies, more truth operating in my life. You know how many times little lies we get caught where we, maybe we don't quite, we tell the truth, we, we, we don't want to hurt someone's feelings or offend, or we don't want to, and we, we always are caught in this, in this realm of, of, of saying the absolute truth or not, or withholding it. Lord, let your truth dwell in my heart. Not deception. I need to know what it is that brings honor to you. I know what it is to put loving kindness for people first. I have to understand what it is to bring honor to someone else, to prefer another rather than myself, to walk in the joy and as I wait for the Lord in the midst of, it, of innumerable evils, in the midst of people gossiping or envy or strife taking place in the family, the home, the business, the church. Do we want, do you really think that you're ever going to have a church that is void of all strife? Certainly not. It's going to be present. Everybody seems to be looking for this church and they say, even the unbelievers will say, oh, there are a bunch of hypocrites down here. All that, because there's a bunch of uh, strife all the time. In the church world, as long as there's flesh nature, you will always have a certain element of strife. It will be present. It's how we respond to it. It's how we deal with it. We must look to the Lord and wait upon Him and rejoice. We rejoice knowing he is coming. We rejoice and know that he is coming and at his coming will be the fullness of joy. But not everybody is rejoicing at the coming of the Lord. Not everybody will rejoice at the coming of the Lord. But those who love God, those who love holiness, those who love truth, those who love love, those who love the Lord will rejoice at his coming. I just spoke to a man not too long ago who says, well, I don't mind going to heaven. I just want to get the fullness of my life out today. Then there's a good dose of the love of the world still in you. The love of the world. And I've heard it, Christians will say that I'm looking for the most that I can out of this life. I'm enjoying my life. I'm, then you don't quite understand your own iniquities then you don't quite understand the sin and the deception and the harm that's going on in this world. You're living in a land that has been greatly blessed by the grace of God. For you and I, our biggest worry sometimes is how much we're going to pay for gas. We haven't been born in some of these poor Asian countries or tribes that are being, and, and young girls being sold, where, where maybe they are looking for the loving kindness and tender mercies of the Lord. Where all of a sudden we look and say, we need the Lord to come back. We need the righteousness of God, the love of God, the tender mercies of God. You and I need the Lord. This church needs the Lord. Laconia needs the Lord. We need the Lord in our lives and in our family. We're looking for, but in the midst of all of this, we're waiting. And we're working while we're waiting. And we're working as we're waiting for the Lord in a spirit of rejoicing. Does that make sense? We're waiting for the Lord. We're working as we're waiting for the Lord. And we're working as we're waiting for the Lord in a spirit of rejoicing. That is Psalm 40. The best thing that you can do now is spend the week, read it. Look at the words. Read it in light of David. Realize that verse 8 is the key. It's the hinge. Verse 8 is the hinge. Verse 8 is the key. 
it leads all up to verse 8, and everything after 8 is built off of it. It leads up, verse 1 through 7 lead up to verse 8, and at verse 8, the rest of it is built on it as a foundation. And it's this, I delight to do your will. That's the joy, that's the rejoicing. I rejoice, I want to do your will, oh my God. My God, not some per possession, personal. Like my, my boys say, that's my dad. I'm proud to be their dad. It's my dad. It's not their dad, my dad. I rejoice, I delight, it's my passion to do your will, Lord, not my will. Jesus said it himself. This is built on and even pro prophesying the coming of the Lord. Not my will, Lord, but yours. Surrendering, submitting to the things of God. And your law, not my law, not the commandments of man, not traditions. Your law, I want in my heart. I heard it said just the other day, I saw an article by Episcopalian priest, pastor, minister, who said, well, the Bible is something that you can kind of, you, have, you can't take it literally, you have to kind of pick and choose as to what applies, and, and all, of the, all of it you have to look at and, and realize that some of the laws of all the, all the Old Testament laws, all the Old Testament has been made null and void. He said, the only thing that matters now, the only thing that matters now is the love of Jesus. Well, Jesus himself said, that the law is not done away with, the law is fulfilled by loving God. It's not a negation, it's not making the law void, rather it's a fulfillment of the law. I want to be full of the law of God. My heart needs to be full of the love of God. And here you've got a guy preaching and writing and holding spiritual guidance for people and basically taking out the Bible and telling them that the entire first two-thirds section is worthless. You kind of take sections that will appeal to you or help you or encourage you or inspire you, but it's really nothing you can uphold because it's just been written and rewritten and, and it's just a bunch of men who wrote down their thoughts. And the only thing that really matters in the New Testament is the love of God. Basically, they're just going to preach the commandments of men or whatever their opinion is and give full permission to sin. I, you, I, we need the love of the Lord, the law of God in our hearts. His truth in our hearts. Verse 8 is the key. Verse 1 through 7 build up to it. Verse 8 is the hinge. Verse 9 and on is built off of that. The joy, the rejoicing of the Lord comes by delighting to do His will. You and I now need to know what that is. Lord, place your law in my heart. Your truth your love, your tender mercies, your loving kindness. Just as David cried out, I waited patient for the Lord. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. I delight to do your will. Put your loving kindness and tender mercies in my heart. Preserve me, he says, and I will rejoice at the coming of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Psalm 40. Read it, study it, look at it. Memorize certain sections and make it part of your prayer life. It will greatly enhance who you are in the Lord. Would you stand before him? There is a process. There is a process in coming to know and delighting in the will of God. There's a purpose to it all, is to walk in the joy of the Lord. In all of this, there's a pleasure, rejoicing. Lord, may the blessings of God Almighty be upon us. Lord, that this congregation would walk with the joy of the Lord, yes. delighting to do the will of God. Father, as they walk through this day, and there's many activities that could captivate their minds, many activities that could come as amusement and entertainment. A variety of conversations can ensue, but in the midst of it all, Lord, let them realize the awareness, the awareness of it all, Lord, that innumerable evils and their own iniquities reside around us and in us. We must choose to delight in doing the will of God and have your law filling our hearts. We don't want to serve another commandment other than yours, Lord, to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Father, in your name, bless 
and encourage. In Jesus' name, amen. May the love of God be yours today and forever. Amen.